We're talking the future of digital assets. Is the future already here? Well, that's what we're discussing with Muneeb Ali, co-founder of Stacks. Muneeb, it's your first time on Kitco. Welcome. Glad to be here. We're going to be talking about Stacks and your project and what this means for the crypto community. But first, I'd like to get your take on how blockchain as a technology has evolved over the last 10, 12 years. I know that's a very loaded question because you could talk about that for hours. Just summarize for us, in your opinion, the most significant technological improvement you've seen in the last decade and what this has meant for not just the crypto community, but also global finance, security, and internet technology. Yeah, so I think uh, definitely blockchain started with Bitcoin or, or a big technological breakthrough coming from computer science. And interestingly, the way the industry has kind of evolved is that it's very cyclic, right? It goes through these cycles of three, four years of uh, kind of like engineers just kind of like heads down building uh, different aspects. And then we will see a lot of market interest, like what you would call a bull market, mostly uh, led by Bitcoin and then interest in other crypto assets as well. So we, we are in like cycle three or something. And I think, uh, Every cycle, we see the underlying piping or the underlying infrastructure mature. And, and this time, it really feels like, you know, this might be the time when this technology really goes mainstream because most people on the internet, they don't, they don't, they don't want to care about the underlying infrastructure or the underlying piping and tooling and developer tools, right? Uh, the magic really starts to happen when users can easily uh, use applications and, and other types of things built on top. And I think this is a cycle where uh, more mainstream users are actually getting direct exposure to the applications built on top and they're kind of like feeling the, the magic of the technology. So can you give us a few real life examples of these applications? How can we feel that in, you know, in real life? I was talking to you offline, how I came from a very traditional finance background and you know, I didn't learn about blockchain technology at school. I don't have a computer science background like yourself. So it's difficult for somebody like me to fully understand the complexities behind the scenes. How can I experience this just on a user basis? Yeah, so I think the examples would be that uh, recently we were, we were actually trying to send a wire to some, so we are based out of uh, New York uh, in the US, we were trying to send a wire to somebody in Hong Kong, and they said, why don't you just send us uh, USDT, which is a, a digital dollar built on top of blockchains, uh, which is actually faster and easier for the other party to receive uh, than the traditional bank wire. So imagine instead of waiting like, you know, Typically people wait like some like three days for their wires to clear and so on. Uh, we're talking about literally minutes, right? Like in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, the transaction clears and it's actually way easier for them on the other side because these same things are programmable. So imagine that computer uh, uh, software engineers can actually write code against a transaction that, oh, we just received this digital money and we can do X, Y, and Z with it, right? So this is just a, a example of uh, people showing preference for I would rather receive money on the new next generation networks versus some of the legacy uh, things over there. And then it's not just about money, right? Like that's the, that's the beauty of this technology. Uh, you might have heard a lot about NFTs, the, the yeah. non-fungible tokens. Uh, a lot of artists and musicians are actually discovering this technology as a way uh, to really have ownership of their artwork and their assets online, and then directly connect with their fans and enable them to own these assets and actually get a much bigger uh, share of the profits by cutting out a lot of the middlemen. And that, that phenomenon is taking off. Like it's, it's actually getting, uh, getting, getting pretty exciting. Okay, let's talk about NFTs now. That's a perfect segue. Um, I've been getting some, some letters from viewers asking me to cover this topic in more detail. Some of the questions have ranged from curiosity, mild curiosity to why would I pay for something that, first of all, why would I pay for anything that blockchain related? It's not real. Second, this is not my words. Second, why would I pay for art, digital art, based on something somebody else has created that's further doubly not real because it's just, you know, you're, you're creating, you're creating um, a derivative, a blockchain derivative on something that, that already exists. Can you comment on some of these concerns? Yes. So I think the, the way to think about this is, uh, broadly speaking, what NFTs are doing is that they're bringing the concept of ownership uh, to the internet. If you, if you think about the real world, like you can actually own assets. You have a, you have a house, you have some kind of like, you know, let's say, let's say you have a painting in the house or you, you have a car and so on. And there is strong ownership in the sense that you know that this thing is yours and only yours. We never had that concept on the internet before. 
And in some ways, like you can, you can forget about blockchain, the technology is just a technology, but what it's really enabling is this notion of strong ownership on the internet. Uh, let's take Bitcoin as an example. Like only you own your Bitcoin and only you can spend it, right? Bitcoin already has a trillion dollars in market cap now. And I think it's becoming clear to people that yes, this is something uh, which is digital, but I own and only I truly own and nobody else. And I think with NFTs, you're extending that concept to other types of things, not just digital currencies. So what you're saying is I could actually own a uh, digital license or I could own a, a ticket to a concert that, that is digital or I could own an artwork. And I think the artwork example really throws off people. But the way to think about that is the NFT is actually the autograph. It's not the artwork. So what you're really talking about is that the original author uh, uh -huh. signed something and gave it to me. And there is provable ownership of that, just like there's provable ownership of your Bitcoin. Right. And that is the thing that is valuable. And that is the thing that, that people are, uh, are, are paying for. So let's walk through a real life example now. Beeple, the artist, created a montage, a collage. Uh, of several pictures and he put that into a digital uh, piece of art that was sold for $69 million using Ether. What The person who bought that uh, Beeple artwork, what was he actually paying for? What does he have ownership rights of exactly? Yeah. Yes. So I think the ownership rights are for this digital object where, um, you know, as I said, that you should really think of NFTs as the autograph, like in the sense that there is an authentic almost like signature from Beeple that this is the original work that I created. Now imagine that people can try to copy the image, but you could actually argue that it makes the original more valuable. Just like, just like the Mona Lisa, like imagine how many different mm. uh, people have taken pictures of it or have tried to recreate it. And it's like, almost like, you know, it becomes more famous, the more yes. people try to take pic pictures of it and so on. So I think people can go ahead and try to copy the image that he has created. But in, in many ways, that would actually add to the value of the original, because what you're saying is that the artist actually signed in a verifiable way to say, this is the original work that I created, and I've transferred the ownership of that to this, this, this particular party. Okay, and that artwork, only one NFT can be created on that, right? You can't have multiple NFTs on that? So in case of Beeple, like that was, that was uh, a, a, a one-time thing but people can create sets as well. That you can say that I'm creating a set of 10 okay. originals. And, and I think the, the concept uh, that a lot more people might be familiar with uh, might be you know, sneakers, that Nike comes up with some sort of a limited set of sneakers. There are only going to be a thousand of them. And people would you know, stand in lines overnight to try and get that limited edition, right? So it gives artists and uh, musicians uh, this ability to create such limited, scarce digital assets and then directly kind of like, you know, sell them to their fans. Well, is it scarce though, uh, Muni? Because let's say you, you brought up the Mona Lisa. Let's take the Mona Lisa, for example. How many people can create NFTs on the Mona Lisa, which is currently in the Louvre right now? Um, could I do that? Right. So I think, I think what, what you're, uh, I think what's important to understand here is anyone can create copies right? And those copies are not going to have any market value, right? Like the market value is actually associated with the reputation and the identity of the artist. Like okay. people are only interested in, uh, no, it, it, and, and this is a well-established concept in the art world. Like people talk about prominence of a, of a artwork. They would spend, you know, an insane amount of time and effort trying to actually verify that yeah. is this painting really by, by an artist or not. And it makes a huge difference if it's a fake or if it's actually by the artist. And it's basically, you're trying to make that process more streamlined, where that can, there can be digital signatures and a digital record of transfer of, of, of the ownership that, you know, initially people created something, he sold it, then it was resold and resold again. But now you, you actually have a permanent record of the transfer of ownership uh, using, using blockchain. Do you think that this uh, NFT um, phase, if you want to call it, is in a bubble right now is $69 million for a piece of art, uh, the, uh, the fair value for something that, uh, uh, that is relatively new? So I think uh, the one thing about the crypto industry is that uh, whenever there is, 
I said that it goes in cycles, right? So there's a bear market for a couple of years, and then there's a bull market. And usually bull markets are marked by, uh, you know, a lot of kind of like hype and uh, interest from people that just starts feeling like, hey, is this a bubble or not, right? But the interesting thing over there is uh, you shouldn't underestimate the value of the underlying technology and what it can enable because of certain uh, and like, you know, initial bubble-like behavior that might happen, right? So it's, it's entirely possible. I, I won't comment on people. I think it's a, it's a very, very unique artwork. I'm not an artist. I don't know how to value mm-hmm. these things. But in general, I do think that there is a little bit of a spike uh, and a lot of kind of like hype and marketing around this idea of NFTs. And people might find out that, hey, they spent uh, too much money on a, on, a, on a piece of digital art uh, that was highly illiquid, didn't have a secondary market, and they couldn't really sell it. Uh, moving forward when, when the markets uh, cool down a little bit. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that NFTs are not here to stay, right? Like it's a truly almost like a breakthrough technology where uh, imagine that anyone who's a digital creator, people who make YouTube videos, people who create content, like even blog posts or any, any, any sort of content that you're creating online. Now, NFTs are almost like a new type of a file format where you can have strong sense of ownership. You could have a built-in payment mechanism and you can directly connect with your fans to monetize that content instead of you know, looking at different types of uh, alternate models like showing people ads on your blog or basically giving a lot of the uh, potential revenue to uh, centralized parties. Like imagine if you're tweeting on Twitter, Twitter benefits from it, you don't, mm. right? And, and same, same with other types of content. I think what NFTs are really doing is this fundamental shift in the relationship between creators and and uh, and and people who are willing to kind of like engage with uh, with those creations. So you think NFTs could evolve to having broader applications, not just within the art community? A- absolutely. I think uh, in some ways the uh, those applications are already possible, and they have been possible for many years. It's just that uh, the specific application in the art world and the yeah. adoption by a lot of famous artists and and musicians is bringing a lot of attention to the space now. And it's entirely possible that this is the application that takes the entire crypto industry more mainstream. Because I think as people kind of like learn more about NFTs, they will start learning more about digital assets and private keys and and all all sorts of other things that are possible. I want to talk a little bit about DeFi now. Um, The rise of decentralized finance, again, is something relatively new within the blockchain world. And I can't help but notice that it happened concurrently with the huge spike in Bitcoin and most crypto assets classes, but Bitcoin in particular, uh, last year, as you'll know, prices went up dramatically in just a one-year period. Was there a correlation here? Yeah, so my working theory on this is I think that Bitcoin actually leads the the crypto industry. And uh, within Bitcoin, there is this concept of Bitcoin halving, where Bitcoin becomes more scarce every four years. And whenever that happens, some sort of market dynamics basically uh, kick in where the price of Bitcoin appreciates at a very high level. If something is becoming more and more scarce and there's more and more demand for it, like you would, you would, you would just, you know, it's a supply and demand thing where prices would like to go up. But what happens with the rise of the price in Bitcoin is there's a lot more attention to everything else that's going on in the crypto industry. And which is in some ways very healthy because there is a lot of innovation. People are uh, coming up with new types of financial products. Uh, like imagine that instead of going to a bank and taking a loan, uh, programmers are automating that process where you could uh, put up a collateral in digital dollars or, or other types of uh, crypto assets and then uh, draw, draw out a loan. Uh, you can actually measure risk for that loan in a much better way because every, everything is like more transparent and more programmable. So in, in many ways, the decentralized finance market is a little bit like opening up the closed black box of Wall Street and giving these different Lego blocks to engineers who can actually build a much better open source, more transparent mm-hmm. uh, type of contracts that, are, that, that can be the building blocks for financial uh, applications. And that's, again, a ra- radical shift from the way that, that you know, Wall, Wall Street or other large financial institutions are used to working. So are you saying the price leads the technological innovation here? Am I understanding you correctly? I think the price leads to discovery of the innovations that happened in the last cycle. 
Okay. And then it leads to interest from more engineers, more investors. I see. And a lot of, a lot of people want to come and work in the crypto industry. I and see. it's uh, it, it's a very interesting. I've seen this uh, this story play out three times over now, right? Like when yeah. I started, Bitcoin was ninety dollars, and now it's sitting at like uh, fifty thousand. Yeah. So it's, yeah, fifty thousand, fifty-five thousand. Is this the mature state? That the, is a steady state for Bitcoin now. Can we go much higher? Are our engineers satisfied with this price? Everyone's coming into the space now. We don't need to go much higher. What do you think? Yeah. So I think I'm in general long term very bullish on bitcoin like mm -hmm. personally I, I i'm still buying and mm -hmm. uh interestingly but i do think people should realize the the, the risks here uh the general framework that you know i use is that it's a cyclic market uh even uh you know 20 30 percent corrections can open happen overnight but uh even up to 80 percent corrections can happen uh in a, in a six months to a year uh time frame so i think mm -hmm. people should definitely view that as a uh risky asset, relatively speaking, but in many ways, not having any Bitcoin at this point might actually be even more risky than having some small amounts of assets. And again, none of, none of this is uh, financial advice. Like it's yeah, basically yeah. my view on, uh, you know, just given the potential of the, the technology and right. the, the asymmetric upside, like having some small amount of money that you can really afford to lose uh, in, in Bitcoin, uh, might 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 be the more rational thing to do at this point. So one more question I want to talk about stacks. Uh, I've been getting questions from my inbox around security tokens. It's uh, kind of this new thing that's emerging in 2021. Tell us about that. Yes. So I think uh, security tokens are effectively, think of that as a company stock or a cap table of a company that is represented uh, on top of a blockchain. So it becomes more tradable, easily transferable, just like the benefits I talked about earlier, where instead of sending a wire, uh, you could send somebody digital dollars and that's actually faster, easier to do it, right? So instead of having a, almost like a paper cap table, you could create these digital assets that represent the cap table of a company. And these things can then start trading on, on crypto exchanges and so on. So one unique thing about uh, these types of security tokens is that uh, it's, a, it's a heavily regulated area. So in the US, the, the SEC and other regulators are very concerned about making sure that any such uh, security tokens are, are complying properly with the existing securities regulations. Uh, my company actually did the first ever SEC qualified offering. And that was a little bit of a unique thing where uh, the, the asset that we, we were uh, creating and issuing is not a security token. Uh, it's more like gas for smart contracts, but to be very careful uh, and, and comply with the U.S. regulations, we treated the offering as if we are complying. We are we are treating it as if it was a security in in the U.S. back then, and that was that was a very historic moment. Like that was the first time ever uh, that a crypto asset got SEC qualification, uh, and and the general public in the U.S. Uh, was able to participate in the offering. Yeah, we'll follow up on the story as it becomes uh, even bigger. Muneeb, let's talk about uh, Stacks now. You co-founded this while you were at Princeton. I'd like to learn a little bit more about this company. And also, uh, first of all, you went through the prestigious Y Combinator program. I'm curious as to what the attitude was surrounding, uh, surrounding this project amongst the uh, VC community. So did venture capitalists kind of just roll their eyes on another blockchain company? Or did they show a lot of interest? Uh, is this like... Is this like AI or any of the, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality, any of the other uh, buzz themes that we heard over the last couple of years? Yes. So I think the, the project started, uh, as you mentioned, at Princeton University, where I did my PhD. And the, the project is really about trying to build a next generation internet infrastructure where users are, are more in control. And we discovered blockchains uh, along the way, right, like as a very elegant solution uh, for what we are building. You mentioned Y Combinator. So imagine in 2014, uh, you know, going through uh, Y Combinator when mm -hmm. not a lot of people know about crypto, not a lot of people know about blockchain. And it really felt like, you know, uh, people would treat what we were doing and uh, another friend of mine, Juan, who built Filecoin, another uh, pretty, pretty, pretty large crypto project. Uh, people would treat us as like, you know, these guys are like R&D labs, right? Like, or right. they're just working on like sci-fi. <laughs> and most people, most, most people wouldn't understand like what these things are. Yeah. And interestingly, I think you're right that um, I would say that the really sophisticated top investors and funds, they would actually understand what you're doing and they were very interested. So we were, we were fortunate enough to raise capital from 
uh, Union Square Ventures, like they've been, they've been they're, they're one of the top funds in the, in the US. They've done Twitter, Zynga, uh, MongoDB, Etsy, a bunch of these uh, different successful companies, Coinbase as well, which is, which is kind of like going public now at a, at a hundred billion uh, valuation. And uh, those people got it, right? Like they understood the potential, but if you talk about the VC industry in general, then as you go down the ladder, like in the ranking of the, the funds, uh, you would clearly see that very quickly you'll start hitting people who, who have absolutely no idea what this is and they don't understand it and they they actually uh, uh, would would not would not invest in it because they would think that this is something uh, completely ridiculous and is never going to work and so on. All right, so let's tie this back into uh, what we had discussed previously. So, given the evolution of blockchain technology, given where you think this space is headed, how does Stacks fit in? What is your long-term plan for, for the company and how you plan to evolve along with the technology? Yes, so I think uh, it's a it's an open source project, right? And there are many companies working uh, in it. So Stacks basically brings uh, smart contracts to Bitcoin uh, in the sense that Bitcoin has a trillion dollars in market cap and most of the Bitcoin are pretty much like passive, right? Like people just hold them. Uh, they can't really deploy that capital especially they can't really deploy that into smart contracts. There yes. are other types of blockchains like Ethereum and others where smart contracts are possible and people are act actively deploying their capital into lending applications or decentralized exchanges uh, or, or stable currencies and, and so on, right? So we basically bring that type of functionality in a much more secure and scalable manner directly to Bitcoin. And, and this, this, this thing, uh, we are we are a bunch of computer scientists. Like you know, we are uh, uh, a couple of Princeton professors are involved. A couple of colleagues that did their PhD with me, they're involved. And there is a lot of fundamental computer science breakthroughs in terms of programming languages and in terms of scalability that we bring to the Bitcoin blockchain. We actually think that uh, any application that basically shows traction in the crypto industry would eventually get implemented on top of Bitcoin because right. Bitcoin is the, the largest network, the most secure network. It has the largest capital base. You were talking about DeFi earlier. Like if uh, there is some DeFi application that is showing traction, it makes a lot of sense to, to deploy it on top of the trillion dollars of Bitcoin capital, right? So this is what, what Stacks brings. And uh, it's, a, it's a decentralized project. It's a, uh, as I mentioned, there are many companies working on it. My company specifically builds developer tools uh, in, in, in the Stacks ecosystem. Uh, well, best of luck, Muneeb. Let's follow up soon on, um, on your company's development, and uh, we'll talk again about some other, other crypto subjects. Thank you for coming to the show today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin.